Welcome, everybody, and uh, welcome to Andrew Rabinovich, who is the director of deep learning at uh, Magic Leap and advisor to Neuromation. Hello, Andrew, how are you? Good morning, Robin. Uh, we will be talking about exciting topics uh, that uh, a lot of uh, people are talking about but not a lot of people practice to the level that you do, artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, and uh, um, more exotic topics, trying to make them comprehensible. So uh, when did you start in, in AI? Um, so the story goes back um, almost 20 years um, when I was still an undergraduate at the University of California in San Diego when I started um, building um, computerized com uh, microscopes, or as we called them back then, cytometers, um, where we were trying to detect um, cancer in tissue samples. Um, then uh, we were using basic uh, image processing techniques, but very, very quickly I realized that um, those weren't sufficient and much more research in back then machine learning and computer vision was needed. And that's when I started um, my graduate studies um, in computer vision and machine learning. Um, so since uh, 2002, um, I've been sort of studying uh, theoretical and applied uh, machine learning and computer vision. And nowadays we call this sort of classical vision and machine learning. And I've been doing that until 2012 when the deep learning revolution kind of occurred. At that time, I was um, working at uh, Google, uh, working on all sorts of things uh, related to photo annotation and computer vision. Um, and then there, I sort of quickly realized that deep learning um, is a, has the capability of solving problems that classical vision has never dreamed of. Um, then almost overnight, they quickly switched um, to deep learning altogether um, and started uh, sort of spending all of my time on sort of the theory of uh, deep computation as well as applications um, to computer vision. Uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, since uh, the 80s or even before, there were two kinds of approaches. Uh, a top-down approach uh, using expert systems, uh, rule-based uh, classification, uh, all um, kinds of uh, ways that we tried to teach computers uh, common sense and uh, how to make decisions based on our understanding how we reason. And on the other hand, there were bottom-up approaches um, spearheaded by uh, artificial neural networks uh, that uh, tried to uh, abstract the rules of reasoning without making them explicit, but uh, uh, as if uh, the computers were able to discover these rules by themselves. Uh, the neural network-based approach appeared at the time to have uh, very severe limits and uh, was kind of the losing uh, part of the, the AI balance and the AI approach. What made it uh, burst into the forefront again? You said in 2012, uh, suddenly something happened. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. Um, so neural networks um, and sort of this Artificial intelligence as a field have been around um, since sort of 60s, uh, from the days of Marvin Minsky and McCarthy, um, when people have been thinking about from sort of psychology, uh, abstract math and philosophy about um, artificial intelligence. But of course, back then, the computation was the limiting factor into any kind of um, experimentation and proofs. Um, when talking about artificial intelligence, we have to be very clear 
that it's not a fundamental science whose mission is to describe and understand nature, but rather an engineering discipline that's tasked with solving a practical problem. Um, in order to solve practical problem problems, um, sort of two critical components must come together. First is um, sort of the computing power or the engine that processes information. And the other is the data or, if the, or the gasoline, if you will, for an internal combustion engine. Um, the reason why this revolution took place in 2012 is because these two components came, came about together. Um, the existence of uh, fast compute, mainly the GPUs, and the abundance of uh, images on the internet with, the, with, with a large presence of uh, mobile devices enabling to capture um, information, whether it's images or speech or text. Um, ironically, the underlying math and the theory of artificial neural networks, or as we call them, deep neural networks now, nowadays, hasn't changed very much. Um, the model of a neuron um, was introduced by Frank Rosenblatt in, in the 60s, um, which until today is uh, very much a current one with a small modification that an activation function or the nonlinearity um, has been simplified even further from a um, sort of a uh, logistic function like a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent to something even simpler um, that's a rectified linear unit. Otherwise, the general structure of a neural network has remained the same. Um, one interesting uh, development that was brought forth by Jan LeCun in the late 80s is this notion of um, convolutions. Uh, which was inspired by um, experiments of, on sort of biological experiments of Huber, Huber and Weisel, um, indicating that there's this hierarchical structure um, incorporating pooling of simple and complex cells. And this is what the original multilayer perceptron was missing. Um, and with the introduction of these convolutional features um, that was first manifested by a neural network called Neurocognitron by Fukushima in 1988. Um, these networks are really the models that we're using today. Of course, the models are now deeper and wider and run across multiple machines, but, but the essence um, is pretty much the same. Every, the learning algorithm, um, mainly backpropagation using uh, stochastic gradient descent, was introduced by um, Jeff Hinton in 1986. So essentially for the last 30 years, the guts of, of this technology um, hasn't changed. So the, 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 the pillars of, of success effectively is the data and the compute. And uh, indeed, uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, uh, Moore's law is what enabled for the past uh, 50 years computers to become more and 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 more powerful. 50 years of exponential growth uh, will really make a, a big difference. So um, as uh, the availability of large amounts of data and very powerful computational platforms uh, became available, uh, neural networks and, and deep learning started to um, to to perform um, there was a, a large data set there is still a large data set for objectively testing the performance of uh, of neural networks uh, in uh, vision tasks uh, and if i am not mistaken um, the 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 test as performed by humans would beat um, machine recognition, but image recognition by machines started to get better and better. And today, machines are as good or better than humans in recognizing tasks on that uh, on that data set. Is that right? That's correct. Um, so um, one of my uh, colleagues 
um, from Stanford um, and now is at Google, uh, Professor Fei Fei Li um, did a sort of a monumental effort in comprising together um, this data set that you're talking about that's called ImageNet. Um, it's a collection of about 10 million images um, comprised of about 1,000 categories um, with the task of being able to identify the prominent category that's um, exhibited in a given image. Um, the state of the art today um, of the best uh, performing deep neural network uh, yields an accuracy of about 97% um, for top five uh, classification, while humans are only able to achieve 95% accuracy. Um, having said that, the deepest and largest deep neural networks that perform the best on these uh, data sets have about the same number of neurons as a little tiny rodent like a mouse or a rat. Um, what these approaches are good at, at recognizing patterns. So unlike humans, they never forget and they never get distracted and there's never an ambiguity between two types of bridges or two types of airplanes, something that humans aren't very good at reasoning about. However, I want to sort of point out right away that these tasks are very loosely related to any kind of general intelligence, decision-making or reasoning. These tasks are primarily focused with pattern matching and detection of uh, observed phenomena. So the, these things are really very good at memorizing with some amount of generalization to unseen uh, observations. Well, humans are actually making to infer from very limited uh, learning. That's why this particular data set requires there to be hundreds and thousands of training examples for these networks to get really good at doing what they do. But as soon as you scale the number of uh, representations to tens of examples, then human performance will only suffer uh, slightly while the degradation and accuracy for the machines will be very significant. Uh, when you talk about the deepest deep learning systems, you are referring to the layers of uh, analysis and, and abstraction, is that correct? And, and how many layers are we talking about when we talk about the deepest deep learning today? Um, so the, the sort of the most widely used deepest networks is something that's called a, a, a residual network or ResNet that comes from uh, Microsoft research. And that has about 151 layers where each of those layers is also often made up of um, subcomponents. Um, to my knowledge, um, people in the sort of in academic circles have pushed the boundaries of these networks to go up to a thousand layers. But the question is, isn't just about the number of these layers, but also about the, the width of the layers and their respective uh, depth. Um, in fact, um, there's some theoretical um, sort of results that suggest that only with a two layer neural network without specifying its width and depth of, of each specific layer, it is possible to approximate any mathematical function which suggests that with a two layer neural network and basically a network that's comprised of two linear layers with two nonlinear activations that follow, we're able to approximate any mathematical function. Hence, we're able to solve any uh, machine learning task. Of course, the fewer layers you have, the harder it is to learn. That's why people build these ginormous things because the training becomes much simpler. Now, um, the data sets uh, out of real world are hard to collect. And the more uh, differentiated 
um, areas you want neural networks to work on, the larger the task of collecting, separate, uh, well-designed data sets for those various tasks becomes. And it is not a coincidence that large corporations like Facebook and Microsoft and Google uh, are uh, very busy in uh, um, doing that, whether with uh, the cars that are uh, taking photos uh, of streets uh, in the world or whether it is uh, analyzing the photos that are uploaded uh, by the billions um, over uh, social networks and, and, and so on. However, uh, that really is a limiting factor for startups uh, with uh, teams of passionate and creative uh, individuals to take advantage of, uh, of uh, deep learning approaches. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, in fact, since the emergence um, of deep learning, um, the sort of the protection as of, of um, sort of intellectual property has shifted from algorithms, which now everyone freely shares. You're not able to publish any um, sort of scientific achievement without publishing the algorithm and the code along with it, um, shifted to the protection of data. So now rather than being sort of the most powerful team because you have the best algorithms. Now you're the most powerful enterprise because you have the best data. And that's exactly why Google and Facebook are ahead um, of most other companies, not because they have more computers or because they have um, smarter researchers, um, but simply because they have most data. Um, data com uh, comes in, in two flavors. Um, raw data, something that one can acquire sort of just by going around and recording, whether it's speech, text, voice, or any other modality. Um, but more importantly is the annotations of the data. And that's where it becomes very, very difficult to scale. Um, having accurate and detailed annotations of the data, or as we call them in, in the scientific uh, circles, ground truth, is very, very hard to obtain. Um, one option is to collect um, the ground truth by the virtue of recording. For instance, if you sort of want to take pictures of cars, you have to a priori know the location and the position and the make and model of each vehicle before you take a picture. Um, and the second approach is to, once the data has been collected, then it needs to go through this manual and very laborious, expensive and slow effort of manually labeling it. And as you know, there exists such services as Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower and many others that actually uh, allow you to submit your data to these services where human labelers go through these uh, tedious tasks of labeling. Um, aside from being expensive and slow, the problem is that A, humans make mistakes. B, oftentimes the questions that are being asked are ambiguous, where it's not trivial. Like if I show you a picture of, of a certain animal and they say, you know, is it is it this kind of a cat or that kind of a cat? Unless you're a true expert of cats, you, you at best would guess, but that guessing would then translate to mistakes in the model that you would train from that data. Um, and finally, humans are not able to do certain tasks at all. For instance, if I show you an image um, of some gallery or a church and I say, which direction is the light coming from? Or how many light sources are there in the room? Um, this is something that humans certainly can't do because it's such, people are very good at relative 
estimations, but nothing specific. Or for example, if I give you an image of a street with a car on it, and I say, how far away is the car from a traffic light? You would say, you know, three, four meters, maybe five. I look at it, I'll say it's two meters, maybe 10. But there's, it's impossible to say exactly what the, dist the, the absolute metric distances are. But in fact, that's exactly what's required for self-driving cars or autonomous navigation by any kind of robot. So th those things are extremely difficult. Um, the reason why these Google cars and all these other self-driving companies have these crazy sensors on the cars as you see them driving is for that reason exactly, because as they drive and take pictures of the world, they want to measure everything as precisely as possible because they know that humans aren't able to label um, such things. Um, so given these two approaches of labeled and unlabeled data, um, this directly translates into two kinds of uh, machine learning algorithms. Ones that are called supervised learning, where you learn by having examples with annotations, and unsupervised learning, where you're just trying to get an, under an understanding without any real supervision. And a, a great example of that is um, these um, generative adversarial uh, networks, as you've probably seen, that are able to render these of crazy images of cats and dogs and people and so forth. Um, but that's still not enough. So the approach that many people um, have taken, including uh, guys at OpenAI and at DeepMind, is to go the synthetic data route and to create synthetic environments where everything is perfectly labeled by construction, right? As you build this 3D world with cars, people, trees, streets, and so forth, by virtually creating all of this in computer graphics uh, software, you automatically know the locations of and positions of everything. You know which way the light bounces, you know the direction of the surface normals, you know the reflectance properties of all the materials, and so forth. So effectively, you have everything you want. The problem with that, go ahead, sorry. Uh, so uh, you started to, to mention uh, what is uh, the uh, breakthrough in the approach of, of neuromation that, uh, that you are advising. Uh, the approach that rather than relying on a data set collected from the physical world um, creates data set. And, and these data sets uh, are called synthetic data. And uh, one of the reasons why synthetic data is so interesting is exactly because it opens uh, the possibility for uh, teams that are not at Google, not at Microsoft, not at Facebook, uh, to take advantage of, uh, of deep learning uh, approaches uh, and neural networks and apply AI techniques to the problems that they are passionate about. So uh, you were saying uh, uh, some additional features of, of, of synthetic data and, and what the consequences of this approach uh, are. Um, so it, as you correctly point out, um, since uh, it's very expensive to obtain real data with proper annotations, and since unsupervised learning techniques are not yet powerful enough, I think going the, the route of creating synthetic data and training models on those uh, data sets, I think is a practical uh, path forward. Um, there's still many challenges as to um, how to create this data, um, whether this data resembles the real world environment, but I think these tasks, or these problems rather, are no harder than the, ta than the problems in unsupervised learning. So I think uh, tackling um, AI from that perspective is, a, is, is, is an excellent uh, endeavor. Um, and and uh, to concretely describe, um, in terms of hardware, the synthetic images 
of uh, uh, artificial three-dimensional worlds that, that can be photographed through virtual cameras are uh, created through um, uh, the graphics cards that um, are practically the same or used to be the same uh, that are used for 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 gaming, and 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 that is uh, whether made by uh, Nvidia or or other uh, computer um, chip uh, and and card manufacturers, is because the same uh, computational power required for rendering uh, the ever more beautiful images of. Uh, uh, and detailed images of uh, artificial worlds in, in computer games is the same uh, hardware that can be used for synthesizing the images to train these uh, neural networks. Uh, that's completely right. Um, it used to be that um, sort of most photorealistic uh, graphic renders were based on um, uh, CPUs rather than GPUs. Um, things like Maya and V-Ray renders. Um, but recently, maybe two years ago, um, Unreal Engine uh, started working on uh, renders using uh, GPUs. Um, and it is becoming a fairly common practice in, in, in this sort of deep learning community to, to use these GPUs and video cards from NVIDIA mainly. Um, and use Unreal um, Engine to, to render um, these synthetic uh, examples, um, something that can be done effectively in real time. Traditional renders on CPUs, although were of higher um, visual fidelity, took uh, much, much longer, up to you know, 15, 20 minutes per image to, to get a, a good rendering. With speeds that slow, one could argue that it's not feasible to produce millions of examples uh, to train deep neural networks. But with the Unreal approach on, running on a, a GPU practically in real time, then all of a sudden this solution becomes attractive because you can create a tremendous amount of data in, in a reasonable amount of time so that you can train these large deep networks. Um, so the, again, it's this confluence of technology for production of synthetic data together with an abundance of um, really fast and powerful um, graphic cards. And um, I don't know whether it is a, a coincidence uh, or beautiful synchronicity that one of the reasons or an additional reason these cards are uh, more and more widely deployed not only in the personal computers of gamers but also in uh, server racks uh, of, of specialized uh, uh, but still widely uh, distributed um, uh, setups uh, is because the same card uh, the same type of hardware uh, the same type of GPU-based uh, computation is also used in uh, uh, mining uh, Ethereum uh, or mining uh, uh, certain types of cryptocurrencies. And uh, the cryptocurrency mining, since now we are jumping from the field of AI in the, the field of, of, of blockchain is worth repeating very briefly, is uh, uh, just a metaphor. Nobody's mining any kind of rare metal. Um, uh, actually, I think it is a somewhat unfortunate metaphor. Uh, I personally prefer to use uh, uh, the, the metaphor of weaving, uh, uh, where uh, there is a pattern emerging from the collaborative effort uh, of uh, intricate uh, cryptographic work. But in any case, whether we use one or the other, um, these operations are necessary to assure the robustness of the uh, trust network that blockchain operations uh, implement uh, and to make it impossible to uh, falsify the transactions and to falsify the operations over this uh, network, to make it computationally unfeasible 
uh, through um, the effort expanded in uh, the cryptographic operations across uh, uh, all, all those who participate. And so Neuromation uh, actually put the two together. Neuromation says uh, there is this challenge of democratizing access to the powerful approaches uh, of uh, uh, neural networks and deep learning in artificial intelligence uh, on one hand that needs synthetic data created through GPUs and on the other hand they observe here is this widely available uh, hardware uh, network of uh, GPUs uh, deployed for blockchain operations and they put the two together. So describe a little bit how that works and, and, and why is that so powerful? Um, yeah, so it's quite um, remarkable that um, everything that's involving um, sort of what in my mind is the next breakthrough in AI, um, mainly the training of deep neural networks, as well as creating data for training these neural networks can be done on identical hardware. So you don't, in, in the past, you had to have some super, cray super computer that would do your modeling. Then you would have to have your graphics render farms that are made of entirely different hardware um, to create the data for simulations. And then you have to put them together and so forth. Um, nowadays, it's very interesting that on a single GPU, you can both create the data for training and train. To sort of add to the coincidence, um, there's been this uh, explosion of um, cryptocurrency mining that also uses these GPUs. Um, interestingly, after the sort of this uh, cryptocurrency craze has kind of settled down, people are starting to realize that the biggest flaw in this whole design is that people have to, in the mining process, people have to perform a significant amount of computation. However, at the end of the uh, computing process, they get rewarded with um, their Bitcoins or other um, cryptocurrencies. Um, but in fact, the result of computation is completely discarded and thrown away. That's, it's almost like you go and learn French and then at the end of it, you get a, you get a, a piece of chocolate that everything you've learned is completely forgotten. So it's, it seems kind of a waste. Um, so the, the idea behind uh, Neuromation is that instead of mining um, just for the sake of getting a key to get more uh, bit, Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies, um, you mine uh, by sort of by the virtue of solving an actual AI task, whether it's training a deep neural network or creating um, synthetic data for uh, training these neural networks. And at the end of the day, you still get your cryptocurrency, but the result of your computation is actually something useful that can be applied further down the chain for some practical application. This is a bit similar to uh, how uh, those uh, squiggly puzzles uh, that are often displayed when you set up a new account on an online platform um, not only uh, try to uh, keep out uh, scammers and spammers, but uh, when you look at the details, and for example, this system is uh, reCAPTCHA, uh, turns out that the process of verifying that you are human because you are able to recognize the, uh, the words that are displayed, you are actually digitizing books or solving other types of uh, labeling uh, uh, tasks. So practically, uh, the same way as this um, uh, uses uh, humans uh, who need to solve a task, 
but the task rather than being useless, it's a useful task. Similarly, neuro neuromation uh, uses the uh, computational power of the blockchain uh, planetary computer to solve tasks that are needed for the cryptographic network to be secure, but rather than applying that power to solve useless tasks, it is applying that power uh, to build knowledge, to build useful computation. That's absolutely right. Um, I think of this paradigm um, that's similar. Remember back in the 90s, there was this project called uh, City at Home where people were trying to look for extraterrestrial activity and they, were, they didn't have a single computer to do all the work. So they tried to spread this out um, across um, all the PCs that were available at the, in the world. But back then, you would just get bragging rights saying that you helped find um, ET and, and that was um, a reward in itself. Um, now, with the presence of, of blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, it's become very um, sort of natural to spread uh, computation across all the uh, owners and, and, and uh, users of GPUs to be able to do these um, meta uh, processes. Um, and that's why I think this notion of democratizing uh, AI is, is a good description of uh, neuromation because at the highest level, it is really that. It provides people with an opportunity to A, gather um, training data by the virtue of synthesizing it, um, and B, to train uh, deep neural networks um, on the highly sort of required um, GPU processors. Um, these things are abundant in the world, as you said, for miners, gamers, um, and general public um, overall. Um, but the sort of the standard mode of operation is if you are Google or Facebook or Amazon, you go and build a ginormous warehouse of these GPUs, and that's the way where you succeed. You often uh, hear at conferences, uh, uh, engineers from Google present some theory, uh, scientific result, and they say, we spent enough energy on these GPU data centers that would power 5,000 single family homes for three months. On one hand, they get some 3% improvement on this ImageNet data set, but in, in the reality, it's a, a, it's a, a tremendously unfair advantage to, to the smaller players. And B, it's a ridiculously irresponsible way to sort of waste energy um, that could be conserved otherwise. But through this uh, democratized um, approach of this decentralized uh, model training and synthetic data generation, I think these, these limitations um, hopefully will soon vanish and everybody else will be able to sort of uh, achieve the same um, results as the big guys. So, uh, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Uh, uh, certainly your uh, work um, in, uh, in the field of uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and deep learning uh, is of great uh, inspiration and uh, we are both uh, very excited and are looking forward for Neuromation to build and deliver their platform so that access to the advanced tools of AI uh, can be democratized because we all uh, love and use uh, Google, Facebook and, and uh, the uh, tools that uh, large corporations uh, make available but uh, even they realize that uh, talent is everywhere, creativity is everywhere, and we do need to empower those uh, uh, groups all around the world to express uh, their ideas. And uh, uh, that is uh, what I am personally also looking forward to, to see soon. Thank you very much for uh, the conversation today. Thank you. I'm very excited about um, 
seeing Neuromation uh, make these strides forward. Um, and I'm very sort of uh, passionate about making these tools available to, to large masses because I think only through um, large participation um, from around the world will we be able to make sort of uh, next leaps um, in AI and um, sort of intelligence overall.